When I started X.AI back in 2014, it, it is very much different. Like the, the fact that we had an AI domain, um, it was not a thing. Like we, we, we actually had, yeah, I think, I think the community still wasn't sure if we want to call things AI again because of, you know, the, much, the, the branding of AI sort of died in, in, in the 70s and we just switched over to machine learning. Um, I think we, I think we were one of the I think we might be like the third or the fourth company to like a third or fourth like startups in in that in that era um, to to have an AI domain again. Um, My professor told me not to use the word AI for a while there, and that because of its bad reputation of having the AI winter at least once. Um, and when I saw you used it, I was a little bit off. You know, surprise, but I guess you were really ahead of yourself because now it's being used for almost everything. Yeah, yeah, and and for us, that was there was definitely not. I mean, it, it is the certainly um, telling people what we are doing, um, but at the same time, uh, since we were building a uh, a productivity productivity um, you know robot that that have conversation with you to schedule meetings over emails. Um, you know, being able to have a sort of a little bit weirder looking email address, I think stands out and, 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 and sort of piqued people's curiosity a little bit too, right? Well, just for our listeners, let's just tell us what the idea, how it came about and what it is, you know, what is X.AI? I know what it is. I've used it. But for our listeners, what what is it and how did it get into your head and how did you bring it to market? Yeah, so... Um, after um, my, my, my co-founder, CEO of, of, of XLAI, of XLAI uh, and I, we, we actually started another company, uh, Visual Revenue, which uh, we, we were acquired. Um, and after spending some time in the, at, the, at the acquirer, and we were, uh, Dennis and I started talking about you know, what, what the future holds. And uh, one of the areas that we were both really interested and passionate about was productivity. Uh, and specifically talking about how, uh, with the state of AI, machine learning, like what can we do, uh, sort of going beyond data analytics and recommendations, which was what our first startup was uh, was about. Um, and we started talking about, like, well, you know, we, we want to be able to, to start having the machine to do things for you, uh, to sort of give time back to you. Uh, the narrative I, I was thinking about at the time was, you know, we have all these different services, the Facebook and, 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 and Google of the world, which a lot of times, even though they are providing a ton of value and sense, um, but in a time perspective, a lot of time it's about they ended up taking time away, right? You end up reading, you know, endless articles you know, or people's posts or people's pictures, and, and you're actually not gaining time back. And, and, you're not, and, and we wanted to create a tool, a, a system that, Actually, actually, truly fulfill the, the the promise of like giving time back to you, make it, make it making it you more, more productive. Re- remind me, a- Alex, were you contemporaneous or were you before Siri? I think we were hmm. after, um, but right. really, Siri back then was quite early, and Alexa hasn't came out yet. Hasn't come out yet. Yeah, I believe October 4th, 2011, just because I can Google search with Siri really quickly when I was on mute. Right. And you were 2014. So you must it must have been a sparkle in your eye, at least, before then, and they were not as popular. Um, and then what challenges technically did you run into when developing this technology so early? Yeah, so there are certainly quite a few technical challenges. Um, first of all, in, in a product definition perspective, um, we certainly did not uh, think we could build a Siri competitor, nor did we want to. Um, so we wanted to be in a very specific domain that we think we can add value, a uh, high value. Um, so then we, so again, we picked the meeting coordination domain, right? We only care about conversations that uh, talk about meeting scheduling. But even if it's such a constrained domain, the second you dive into it, there's a lot of sort of edge cases, which is the worst thing for, for machine learning algorithms. Um, being able to find enough 
data in for those cases how do you balance those with the more popular cases uh, that's all like just use case and then just sort of product building and product se uh, feature selection becomes a really really big challenge uh, and again back in 2014 2015 um, we really didn't have a lot of this tool set that are out there today, like TensorFlow and PyTorch and so on, um, that we ended up having to build a lot of the pieces on our own uh, to, to, to experiment and to get just the type of performance that we were looking for. How about a time estimate in terms of what it took you to get to an MVP then, and what do you think it would be now with those tools you mentioned? PyTorch, TensorFlow? Well, it depends on how, what, how you define MVPs because, um, you know, one, one way to build something like X.AI in, in the early form, the MVP is you can just put a human behind it, right? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and being, actually having a system, right? And then the, and the, the key part really, or the, actually the philosophy at the time when we're building it is how do we build a really great personal assistant that schedule meetings very effectively for you. And what was the feedback you got when you started releasing this into the marketplace initially? Do people understand it? Um, did they embrace it? Was it a challenge getting people educated on it? So there's definitely a lot of excitement around, you know, the, the, the promise it held and, and what, um, what kind of output uh, people get, right? People, people were getting time back. They, they, they are being able to outsource this pretty tedious and, and annoying task of meeting scheduling and coordination to something else. So I think that there's a lot of positive uh, there. Um, of course, there are, you know, there's this, even today, I think there's a lot of people who, who watched a lot of um, ap apocalyptic movies about robots and AI and, you know, not quite sure they want to embrace that future. So we certainly hear enough of like oh you know what's going to happen how is it is it taking over my job uh that that type of comment in, in in a technology like this actually um most of my complaints when i used x.ai as a uh, paying customer were folks who didn't realize they were interacting with the bot and a lot of it is um what i discerned was more persona issues so mm -hmm. switching between Andrew and Amy, depending on whom I was addressing, seemed to help with some of that. Yeah, that's definitely that's definitely helpful. Um, and we also the the design certainly over over the years we we evolved the design to being more and more sort of in your face about being um, a system, a robot, versus trying to kind of create that interaction that's more human like. Because exactly that point where it seems like people are actually feels more comfortable uh, when they know up front they're dealing with a robot or a system. Oh, that's great yeah. advice on that. Um, and so speaking of being human centric, human friendly, at some point, I guess 10 months ago, you made a transition from X.AI to uh, AI Cure. Uh, can you speak a little bit about that and what you're doing there? Yeah, so I, I lead the engineering team here, which uh, also includes data scientists and, and researcher. Um, so AI Cure is a whole different take in, 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 in AI, uh, but applying it to health. And it's very specifically serving mostly the clinical trial um, part of, of, of health. Right, that uh, when you when you look at, I mean, health is generally is a really big space. And... <clears throat> But for like when it comes to clinical trials, one of the issues is that it's adherence. Um, that when when you have people have you when you have two groups of people uh, taking the medication, um, how do you know that they are following the protocol and the rules in, in regularly taking the drugs? Uh, and in some cases, people might pretend that to, to take the drugs and 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 try to cheat the the, the clinical trial system. And this is where AIQ comes in, in terms of using uh, uh, image recognition, uh, the, the image processing to both make sure that people are following the, the rules, but also uh, in some cases catch the cheaters who are not 
um, actually taking the drugs. Well, Brian, you probably have some thoughts on this as well. You've done some work in terms of uh, detecting adverse re- uh, adverse reactions, right, through text yeah, analysis. Adverse, yeah, adverse events in uh, in uh, medical. Yeah, the FDA increased their requirements for reporting those, and because I worked in natural language processing too, you know, there seemed to be a good fit there for technology finding those needles in the haystack sometimes through social media or through other correspondence. I, I definitely see the connection between X.AI and AI Cure. Um, how is the technology, I mean, you were mentioning you're very early on with the technology with X.AI, but how has it enabled you um, and has it enabled you at AI Cure to do better uh, processing and modeling and other things? Yeah, so in, in AI Cure, we certainly um, be able to build systems that are much more off the shelf in a, in a way. That we, we certainly leverage a lot of the um, cloud computing ecosystem that being able to stand up services much more quickly. Um, and particularly building software in health, uh, you require a whole different level of validation, being able to control your data, being able to provide the level of security, being able to uh, provide the level of repeatability, uh, being able to audit your your whole system, data, processing, and so on, uh, which it would have put a much bigger onus on, on, on the engineering team to, to provide all those items, uh, but being able to uh, build up from uh, you know, AWS and cloud services and kind of the whole ecosystem, a, a lot of those things are taken care of for you. Being able to do proper logging, being able to do to proper monitoring. Uh, don't get me wrong, there's still plenty of things to build on top of all these uh, really great building blocks, but it's just being able to, to stand on top of the shoulders of giants allow um, us to, 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 to thrive and, and actually really build things that our customers want. Uh, reproducibility and explainability are two themes that come up pretty frequently with our guests. How much time do you spend pondering those issues with your use case? Yeah, so for our use cases, is you you is actually required, right? That being able to um, explain what your system is doing uh, to uh, through like informed consent and and through uh, being able to just make sure that our customers are comfortable with with the system so a lot of times being a having a, a black box just doesn't really cut it uh, so being able to demonstrate um, what what is the source data what type of algorithms are we training and making sure that we can retrain that algorithm even though we have gained more data and, and so on and so forth um, is, is really important because of the health use case where and you're you're a father and a participant in the healthcare system now both from a business perspective and i presume a consumer perspective how is the intersection of things like you know data science and machine learning and healthcare and life sciences playing out in your eyes but from both of your perspectives that you have yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I am fascinated by the field. There's certainly uh, a reason why I, I joined AI Cure. Um, I, I think we are, as, as, as a human race, I think we're making a, a tremendous amount of progress uh, over the past you know, 20, 30 years. And it feels like we are accelerating. And I think being able to um, kind of move from chemistry and biology or, or, or combining chemistry and biology with with uh, engineering and, 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 and computation power that we are gaining, um, I just see really exciting progress going forward. And, you know, I think, you know, I, I can totally see that like my sons um, might live to 200 just because we, we have sort of cracked the code. Um, so I, I think it's really interesting, interesting to see what we can do in the next, in, in my lifetime uh, in, in, in health. Yeah, and I hear your, your token of optimism there. Is there any areas you think that it could improve or AI could help the improvement? Or are there any downsides right now to, you know, things not keeping up with each other? 
so again it, it is a it is a uh, interesting balance to um, build health software uh, you you certainly want to move fast but you can't really break things so how do you kind of apply modern software engineering modern data science into building health products I think that uh, is, is an area where the whole industry hasn't quite cracked yet. I think like there's a lot of smart people um, trying different things, improving, and I certainly see it getting better and better. Uh, and I also see the regula regulation also are, are, are trying to move uh, with the times as well. Um, but we're not quite there. So I think there's a lot of work to be done in, in just generally pushing the idea of um, building high quality software but in a much higher speed uh, that's comparable to the, the Facebook and Google of the world. I think that's where a lot of innovation can happen when, when we can have, have the health industry move at close to what, uh, what the consumer tech speed would be, would be like. Alex, you referenced Facebook's kind of famous model about move fast and break things. Is there a possibility, say, like in a, in a car race, where you have extra cars. So if you do break something, you have another car that's exactly the same that can replace that car in the race immediately. Yeah, well, the, the, the challenge in health is that the, the cars in this case are humans, right? So it is, it's, uh, so for example, AI Cure, one of, one of our major functionalities is that we tell you how much, how much drugs you should be taking. If, if we tell you the wrong amount of drugs to, to take, there's some serious consequences, right? So, so it's, it's not just another software bug. It, it could be someone's lives being in danger because of their software. So I think the level of, of responsibility that, that you have is very different than, oh, my news feed didn't show the latest you know, 10 pictures. And um, also, I saw an article you wrote a while back, uh, probably a year ago or so, about how um, people are interacting with each other within X.AI at the time using Slack, you know, thousands of Slack messages. Um, and you kind of mentioned, you know, the way the, the world, the people in the world that are interacting with each other should have some variety to it. And you should, you should have in-person meetings. And, you know, I kind of think about, you know, a person visiting a real doctor or, you know, a person, you know, getting out of the technology system in order to be more human. Um, where's the balance on that? You know, should we have automated doctors? Should we not? Should we, you know, um, what's what's your thoughts on that related to human interactions? Yeah, so I think in in that area, I think we are we are so far from even need, needing to think about electronic doctors. I think um, where I see is that I mean, being being a consumer uh, going to a doctor's office, that I, I think it's very common for for everyone to. End up seeing the doctors being they they're performing data entry tasks. Um, I, I think the industry have moved had a really big push to electronic health records, um, but not with very good design principles, really good software design or data design uh, or in interoperability and so on and so forth. So now things are moving to to, to electronics, but they left actually extra work uh, for, and particularly data entry work to, to the doctors of the, of the world, which actually created the opposite effect of, of now the doctor is heads down typing uh, your conditions and, and instead of having that uh, important conversation with you and being able to have good bedside manner and talk through, guide you through the, the diagnostic process. Um, so I certainly see one of the first major step is taking that um, the, 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 the extra work we put on the, the healthcare providers um, first and removing those burden, burdens and actually, again, giving time back to, to the doctors first. And then we can start talking about like, how can we make their lives better, easier, and again, take away some of the additional low-value tasks uh, that they're doing today with, uh, with machines, with, 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 um, with AI, with other systems. Just a quick comment about doctors and giving them back some of their time. Uh, my 
personal internist has a scribe that types into the EHR for her. So that's how she's handling that. Um, <laughs> is that a person, Don? Or are you talking about a artificial intelligence? It's a person that rolls in with a laptop and accompanies my doctor and is present during the exams. Wow, that's far out. I, I don't think it's that uncommon either. So some of some doctors, they do it. They make the investment. But I did want to go back, Alex, to um, your mention of, in your case, those race cars are humans. And I'd expect that Brian will weigh in on this as well. Um, when you're dealing with clinical trials, you're dealing with people with um, pathologies that will eventually result in some kind of uh, adverse effect, the worst being death. Where does it become part of your process to prevent some of those deaths that would have happened in the old cases of doing um, clinical trials? Well, so I think the the trials designed themselves certainly are, 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 are built at least to the best of their ability to to prevent or minimize that type of effects. Um, I think where our system come into play in, in that area is that so one of the reasons why people stop taking drugs in the, in, in, in the clinical trials is that they have some kind of adverse effect. They, they, they don't feel good. They get a headache. They get a stomach, whatever. Um, but instead of talking to the, um, the coordinator about the condition, they just stop taking the drug, right? And then they drop out of the trial some, in, in some cases. Uh, what we provide is that like, now that we have a near real-time real view of, of your behavior in, in, in drug taking, uh, we can now notify the, the operation team to say, like, you know, the, these three people on your trial, they stopped taking the drugs. You should reach out to them, right? In some cases, you know, uh, it would be a different reason, but in, in, in some of these cases, specifically when, it, when they have a side effect, an adverse effect, now that we have an opportunity for the, for, for the operation team to say, you know what, maybe we can make some adjustments. Maybe we can reduce your dosage and so on. And now we can sort of bring the person back on track, which in that case, um, again, is really just speed up the, the, uh, the success of the, of, of the trial and instead of having people, people drop out. Yeah, I want to switch directions a little bit. We only have a few minutes left because um, we covered this one pretty well. So on your free time, I, I, do you still do mentoring? Uh, are you still in tech stars and things like that? Have you done any of that? And I see you do some advising too. How much of your time is spent kind of outside of work doing more work or uh, what are your passions right now? <laughs> I, I do a little bit. I, do, I spend some time with the tech star team and I also, yes, mentor one specific startup. Um, I, I think it is in. Important that I spend, of course, the primary of, of my time at my core work uh, and then spending also time for myself and, and my family and so on with friends. Um, but I think it is a, uh, I think it, it is a form of giving back, which I think is important uh, for the ecosystem. Uh, but, but in a selfish re reason, it's also good for me in uh, seeing what the interesting ideas that are out there uh, solving other people's problem, you know, once in a while. I think those are actually good for the mind and, and good for uh, having creativity. On the line of Brian's different track, also, I think it deserves to mention that your most recent um, educational experience was an MBA from Columbia Business School. So we always like to discuss how people find their, themselves practicing AI. Maybe ending with that would be a nice one. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, it, it's, uh, the MBA was quite some time ago. Um, and I, I guess I've always wanted, uh, not always, but like, yeah, even when I was going through the MBA program, um, I almost started a company uh, with, with a co-founder. Um, he ended up taking a VC job, and I ended so we ended up not signing the company. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it's very much about getting excited about a problem, and 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 getting so excited about it that you feel like you you need to go out and solve that problem. 
um, that's only how I felt when I started my first company about thinking about how we have all this data we need we've got to be able to do better and and, and do something uh, with them uh, and then continue to seeing sort of the, the advancement in AI and so, so that being able to keep seeing opportunity related to that um, so I think what that's what it comes down to is just like getting something seeing something that you are so passionate about that you feel like you have to do you have to have to jump in and and, and, and do that particular work and, and in my case it turned out to be AI, ML related. And you're way ahead of your time for following your passion. I guess that's the reward of following um, what doing what you love, would you say? Very much so. Because, you know, as some, the startups are hard. Founding companies are hard. Um, when you're not just really excited about what you do, it just it makes a day so long. And, and life's too short. 